Welcome everybody to today's Gems from the Wisdom Traditions, a conversation circle for our very first meeting of the year of 2022. And in honor of the new year and our uh, theme of being truly human. So through our efforts here at Lifelong Learning that we are definitely endeavoring to uh, you know, carve the atmosphere in which we live and move and to improve our lives as human beings that, that way. And to kick us off, not only with the theme for the year, but the theme for this week on being truly human, uh, we've decided to take up the study from the literary tradition of the novel To Kill a Mockingbird which is one that has really uh, such timeless relevance and indeed um, extreme relevance right now at this period in time. And to look at it from the standpoint of not only what is it to be truly human, what is it to be humane? So to do that, we have our dear Robin Shepherd and uh, Robin tells me that uh, even though she is not a student of literature in a formal sense, she's been a lifelong deep reader. And she began her um, training in deep thought with her father, who was a philosopher from the time she was five years old. <laughs> Um, she and I have had the delight of every time one of us brings up a favorite book, the other one goes, oh, that's one of my favorites. And usually Robin has telling, is telling me, I just read that book again. <laughs> and so one of those uh, favorite books that she and I have in common is To Kill a Mockingbird. And so I give you Robin on this idea of being truly human. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I, yeah, I do want to just share this story. Um, I'm relatively new to still in Moving Center. I'm about six months old, so a bit of a baby. And when we first, I, I attended my first staff meeting. And I don't know if all of you know, uh, but the staff meetings begin with a, a sort of a sad song, right? Uh, they begin with the whole week's um, almanac readings. And that was new for me uh, and very, I I think, uh, you know, emotional and involving and intellectual and all these things I didn't uh, normally equate with a, a, a staff meeting. And one of the quotes came from Harper Lee. Uh, it was the one for a father's example for Father's Day. And I couldn't believe it because I was actually able to give quite a lot of context to the quote because I was literally rereading uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, which I just do for no apparent reason other than it just seems like I need to go on retrospectives every once in a while. And that one spoke to me. And then the following week, uh, Renee pulled out a very obscure uh, reference to uh, an Ursula Le Guin novel, and I happened to be rereading that one. So um, we just have this strange connection, which isn't strange because that's a very uh, still and moving center thing to have happen, these confluences and these ways of uh, coming together with thought. And so I'm by no means a, an expert on this, but I'm happy to be a facilitator. And it's interesting because in a completely unrelated, uh, in, in a completely unrelated topic, I came across a quote that I would like to share with you because I think that it has to do a lot with being truly human and a lot with what we're going to talk about today. And it talks about being an expert which is something that I'm not, but I maybe would replace expert in this with something else. So the quote is from someone named James Clear, and he's um, an expert on habits and habit creation. And he says, an expert is someone who over many years manages to remain confident enough to keep trying and humble enough to keep learning. And I would submit expert is a very subjective word and just maybe being a human uh, is someone who over many years uh, manages to remain confident enough to keep trying and humble enough to keep learning. And the reason it, it applied here is because it, it strikes me as very childlike. 
Uh, it's a childlike way of being in the world. Children are confident. They don't know what they don't know. They, they aren't embarrassed to put themselves out there. And, uh, uh, and they're also like need to learn a lot about the world. And that's the perspective of To Kill a Mockingbird completely because it's told from the perspective of starting out a five-year-old, uh, Scout Finch. And through the next three years, um, the sort of tale of her life in a very small Southern town in Alabama. Um, it's a loose parallel to the author's life. It's a semi-autobiographical. And it really is just this encapsulation of uh, observation of social codes and morality and all of the ins and outs of, of the human condition as filtered through the eyes of a child. And that gives us this um, interesting perspective without being overly moralistic. And I guess um, how I, I read uh, To Kill a Mockingbird in high school as possibly many of you read in high school or in college or at some point in in your academics is, is there a show of hands as like did you inter interact with to kill a mockingbird in your in your early days <laughs> yeah um and it's one of those books that like uh renee said it does have relevance regardless of its time in history so it was set in the 30s but it was um, published in the in 1960 uh, just at the beginning of um, a, a, a time of, of upheaval in the civil rights movement in the U.S. And so it was uh, taken up immediately as a popular work of literature. It was everywhere from the very start. And since it's gone on to never be out of print and to um, have been translated into many, many languages, I think it's still 30 million copies and it's been translated into 40 languages. And it's now a standard. It's a hallmark of high school curriculum all across the United States. And one of the things that I found interesting as I was reading a bit about it was that like all good literature, it's very divisive. So in its time when it was published, some people felt as though it was too inflammatory with regard to race. And some people felt like it didn't go far enough with regard to commentary on race. And I think today it's the same thing. Some people look at it as um, sort of quaint and a quaint retrospective of a time in, in history. And some people feel as though um, those things haven't changed much at all, and they are, um, you know, still ongoing. And so there's this school of thought that that things are haven't gone far enough, uh, that the book wasn't progressive enough and didn't push an agenda far enough for civil rights at the time. But then there's also the school of thought that it went too far and it was too provocative and it was too inflammatory. Um, but I think what we can learn from it. Um, is squarely, I think, even from Harper Lee's uh, own words, it's it's squarely um, a code of honor and a code of conduct, uh, conduct that is centered in Christian ethics. And it, from her perspective, used to be the backbone of Southern tradition. And it's woven throughout the whole, um, you know, tapestry of the of the book. And so rather than kind of go on a whole synopsis of it, I thought I would read an excerpt uh, from the book just because it gives a, a deep, a deep example of both the morality, the Christian ethics, and the kind of tapestry of how the book is created. So if that's all right with you, I think I'd do this. And so just to give a little context for this excerpt, uh, Scout Finch is a, a six-year-old. She's going to first grade and she has a very antagonistic relationship with her teacher because she already knows how to read. She's been reading at the knee of her father since she was four. And he, she's a little precocious. Her father is Atticus Finch. He is a, a lawyer, an older than average father who has encouraged um, Scout to be uh, precocious in, in literature. And so uh, her teacher is horrified to learn that uh, 
she knows how to read already and the teacher doesn't feel like she has the thing the thing she needs to teach her so she'd like to just erase all of that and so scout starts out being just this horrible um burden to her because she um points out i guess her flaws as a teacher it's very strange um but this is an 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 episode in the classroom where another student, uh, a very poor student, is put on the spot because he doesn't have any money uh, for a particular thing. And the teacher says, oh, I will lend you a quarter and you can just pay me back tomorrow. And Scout wants to stick up for her, uh, for him, because um, uh, she knows a bit of the backstory. And so I just love this passage because it has so many layers. So that is the, the setting and uh, we'll pick up from there. My special knowledge of the Cunningham tribe, one branch that is, was gained from events of last winter. Walter's father was one of Atticus's clients. After a dreary conversation in our living room one night about a tailment before Mr. Cunningham left, he said, Mr. Finch, I don't know when I'll ever be able to pay you. Let that be the least of your worries, Walter, Atticus said. When I asked Jem what entailment was, and Jem described it as a condition of having your tail in a crack, I asked Atticus if Mr. Cunningham would ever pay us. Not in money, Atticus said, but before the year is out, I'll have been paid. You watch. We watched. One morning, Jem and I found a load of stove wood in the backyard. Later, a sack of hickory nuts appeared on the back steps. With Christmas came a crate of smilax and holly. That spring, when we found a croaker sack full of green turnips, or turnip green, Atticus said Mr. Cunningham had more than paid him. Why does he pay us like that? I asked. Because that's the only way he can pay me. He has no money. Are we poor, Atticus? Atticus nodded. We are indeed. Jem wrinkled his nose. Are we as poor as the Cunninghams? Not exactly. The Cunninghams are country folk, farmers, and the crash hit them hardest. Atticus said professional people were poor because the farmers were poor. As Macomb County was a farm county, nickels and dimes were hard to come by for doctors and dentists and lawyers. Entailment was only part of Mr. Cunningham's vexations. The acres not entailed were mortgaged to the hilt, and the little cash he had made um, went to interest. But if he held his mouth right, Mr. Cunningham could get a WPA job, but his land would go to ruin if he left it, and he was willing to go hungry to keep his land and vote as he pleased. Mr. Cunningham, said Atticus, came from a set breed of men. As the Cunninghams had no money to pay a lawyer, they simply paid with what they had. Did you know, said Atticus, that Dr. Reynolds works the same way? He charges some folks a bushel of potatoes for delivery of a baby. Miss Scout, if you give me your attention, I'll tell you what entailment is. Jem's definitions are very nearly accurate sometimes. If I could have explained these things to Miss Caroline, her teacher, I, I would have saved myself some inconvenience and Miss Caroline's subsequent mortification. But it was beyond my ability to explain things as well as Atticus. And so I said, you're shaming him, Miss Caroline. Walter hasn't got a quarter at home to bring you and you can't use any stove wood. Miss Caroline stood stock still and then grabbed me by the collar and hauled me back to her desk. Jean Louise, I've had about enough of you this morning, she said. You're starting off on the wrong foot in every way, my dear. Hold out your hand. I thought she was gonna spit in it, which is the only reason anybody in Makeham held out his hand, it was a time-honored method of sealing oral contracts. Wondering what bargain we'd made, I turned to the class for an answer. But the class looked back at me in puzzlement. Miss Caroline picked up her ruler, gave me half a dozen quick little pats, and then told me to stand in the corner. A storm of laughter broke loose when it finally occurred to the class that Miss Caroline had whipped me. When Miss Caroline threatened it with a similar fate, the first grade class exploded again, becoming cold sober only when the shadow of Miss Blount fell over them. Miss Blount, a native Macomian, as yet un uninitiated in the mysteries of the decimal system, appeared at the door with her hips, with hands on hips, and announced, If I hear another sound from this room, I'll burn everyone up in it. Miss Carolyn, the sixth grade class, cannot concentrate on the pyramids for all this racket. My sojourn in the corner was a short one. 
Saved by the bell, Miss Carolyn watched the class file out for lunch. As I was the last to leave, I saw her sink down into her chair and bury her head in her arms. Had her conduct been more friendly to me, I would have felt sorry for her. She was a pretty little thing. And so I think that the novel itself is so full of an exploration of social codes and the ways that those social codes uh, influenced not just Gemma and Scout, but all of the people that lived in the town from the ways that um, class was dictated at the time from the ways that race was dictated at the time um, to the ways that um, gender roles were um, dictated at the time. And so one of the things that I thought about uh, and it maybe one potential starting off point for a discussion might be about courage because this book is full of courageous moments from people that you don't normally expect courageous moments from. And the idea that heroism and being um, courageous has two sides to it. One can be that uh, the heroism of yes, uh, I guess we could say the heroism of going along with the current of your own culture the uh, current of uh, what's happening at the moment and being uh, part of it and, and being on the right side of it. Um, maybe taking, for example, firefighters or Peace Corps workers or anyone who's in the, on the cusp of a moment that it feels good to do something. And then there's the heroism and the courage of no. That it's the way of staying, uh, standing against your culture or the tide of, of your community and standing up for something that is not popular. And we actually see both of these things at play uh, in, in different ways within To Kill a Mockingbird. Of course, Atticus Finch is standing against his community when he's representing Tom Robinson, uh, a, a Black man uh, of a crime that he didn't commit. Um, but there are many ways that people are um, doing smaller acts of heroism in service to their community and in tandem with uh, the ways uh, that their community is working. So I think that's one thing um, because one of the components I think of being truly human and humane is courage. And then the second thing I'd like to discuss um, would be about connection uh, and the ways that we make connection with each other. And one of the things that I love about this book is that Scout is our is exposed to many different situations and scenarios where she makes judgments about people without knowing all of the details about them. She has information, but she doesn't have connection. Uh, she makes fantastical stories about her neighbor who is a shut-in um, and doesn't, she doesn't know what really is going on behind the scenes until much later. And when she does establish a connection, it makes a real difference. And so um, in service to that idea of connection and looking into people and establishing something that is, is a, looking into their own humanity, I wanted to introduce a concept uh, called an I-thou conversation or an I-thou communication. And I don't know, is it, is it anything that anyone has heard of before? Possibly, could you have a little, yeah. Uh, so it's, um, the, the idea is by a German uh, theologian, his name is Martin Buber. And I'll just wanna read it because it just encapsulated to me something that I think is this other component besides being, courage, being courageous um, of humanity. And so um, an I-thou relationship is a two-sided affair. When both of the individuals enter into a communication with their unique whole being. The relationship is reciprocal, it's yielding, it's momentary, it leads to clarity and it lacks permanence. It's something that is happening in the moment right now um, in a very mindful way. I thou relationships can occur during uh, communication between people. It can occur between yourself, a person and nature. It can occur between a person and a spiritual being or a spiritual experience. And um, it arises 
both in moments of dialogue and actual what we would consider communication. And it also arises in moments of just indifference or things that we don't necessarily think matter. Um, for example, it can take place between two strangers whose eyes just happen to meet and connect and have an understanding where no words are actually even spoken, but there is a recognition of humanity. And then it's also the other way where you deeply feel and connect with someone um, based on their wholeness and a comp you know, a, a based on recognizing their own light and their own humanity. And you know, from that relationship, a close bond emerges and it's the realm of like a freedom where you're not alone you're definitely part of another. And so there's no I without a thou, there's no thou without an I. It's never just a solo situation. It's always bouncing off of each other and recognizing each other's own humanity. And so I've been thinking about this a lot because as we enter into more transactional communication and more information exchange with all the ways that we can communicate, I wonder what is lost when we substitute transactional communication and information exchange for genuine connection and for those I thou relationships that I think are very well expressed in um, To Kill a Walking Bird. So with that, I guess I would open those avenues of discussion out to people and we can take it from there. What a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much, Robin. I can see people about bursting to ask a question. Maybe Bob first. <laughs> it struck me as very interesting in terms of being human that, as you said, there's kind of two directions. There's information, there's history, and you want to get it right. You want the context, but that's one side and then you talked about spiritual christian ethics and to me that's the kind of where it's transformational in other words the, the the two types of learning are exactly opposite one is knowing what's out there and getting it right and the other one is the opposite it's getting it right inside you and it's irrelevant you know there's a in the uh, lotus sutra there's a little paragraph that's like a hagiography, the lives of saints. And when I was teaching history day, we said, don't do a hagiography, do history. Because hagiographies are like, you know, this is a holy person that walks on water and does miracles and none of which you can objectively know about. And there's one story in there of a bodhisattva never disparaging. And every time he saw somebody, he would bow to them and say, I am so happy to meet you. Obviously, you will become a Buddha in another life. And he goes on and praises them. And that was his entire practice. He didn't sit. He didn't do koans. He didn't, he didn't meditate. He just did that, never disparaging. And that something can, you know, can that change you inside? Can that story, you know, there's no evidence that this guy ever lived. I mean, he had a name, but, you know, that's not the point. Does the story change you? And it's just, I, I, I was st struck by that energy because, you know, the I-thou experience is, is sort of one thing and the I-it is what he contrasts it with. But you can have that with anything. If you go to the Grand Canyon and you just take your pictures and you ignore it and it's nothing there, it's an I-it. But if you have a sense of awe or wonderment and this is like, suddenly you're not the same person you were, you know, you're, you're gone. <laughs> There's no I, it involved, that dualism. And it just strikes me, it's kind of interesting because we need both. But, you know, I've been thinking about the environment and how painful that is, the environmental climate crisis and everything. And there's a lot of objective knowledge we need to know and everything. But if we don't change ourselves, that's all irrelevant. And so, when you say, what can I do? Nothing I can do can make a difference. If you transform yourself, everything changes except the outside world. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and it's just, I don't know, I was just, I was struck by that being kind of the heart of, of this thing. It's like, not so much what Scout knows, but who is that person that transferred, her father had something that she could, you know, learn from and change herself, even though she, you know, is making mistakes all over the place. <laughs> so anyway, that I just wanted to respond to that because it struck me that, you know, hagiography is bad history because it's, you know, sanctifying it. And we never wanted a, a history day student to do a thing about Christianity because it's all miraculous. And she'd ha they'd have to say that. And of course that loses the history, but not everything is history. <laughs> Bob, one of the things that I would add to that, uh, and it got me thinking, one of the initial conversations that Renee and I had went back to the topic of how do we individuate? And I don't know if you were there for that one, um, but I think it was John Powers who said a really profound thing. It's actually stuck with me now, you know, all these weeks later, that um, when we individualize, we learn, right? We're learning about the world. And that is that kind of, um, it's that historical context, it's informational. And that's how we develop our preferences and our choices and those things that begin to make us who we are. But it's in the way that we individuate, which relates our preferences, our choices, our learning, back out into the world, back out into the connection with other people. And so what you were just describing um, resonated that way with me is that we can gather in and take in and process, but unless in, uh, unless in until we reconnect it back out to nature, to someone, to a higher being, it doesn't really end it it's it's an unfinished loop it's an unfinished circle do you know what i mean i think you know that's exactly it because you know the i it the it is objectified but so is the i and if you go to i thou the thou is intimately connected with the i so the i and thou the i and i thou is totally different individuated as you say to the i it because you not only objectify the person or thing, you objectify yourself. It becomes dualistic and it becomes, you know, I want it, I need it, I hate it, I like it, you know, whatever it is, it's gonna be that kind of dynamic. And so it's interesting that it's not just the, the it and thou that are problematic, it really comes to what the I, I is itself. Okay. Robin, that was, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. I was wondering if you could say more about the idea of courage in that I, I was thinking of another great author, William Faulkner, who a teacher told me he's thought that life had three stages, innocence, violence, and then potentially wisdom. And I was wondering, like, Scout seems to be innocence, as does Bo, and then Atticus seems to be wisdom. Somehow he got through violence to a higher stage of wisdom that seems to have something to do with that idea of connection too. But is it somehow courage that allows us to get through the realm of separateness to the state that Atticus was in of, of a higher sense of connectedness, which was really true courage? And also maybe if you could say something about the scene about the rabid dog and maybe if that has something to do with courage too. Yeah, thanks for that. The scene with the rabbit dog is actually one of my favorites. It is the thing that was referenced in the almanac itself. And so um, for people who are trying, you know, kind of trying to remember that idea um, in the, the dog days of summer uh, in the South, uh, one of the, the things that happens it happened then in the in the 1930s um, was that dogs would go rabid sometimes and obviously very dangerous, dangerous to children, dangerous to other animals, dangerous to people. Uh, and so people would just go inside their house and shut the door and not deal with it, right? There's a way for it to go on by and then potentially like 
wreak destruction on their neighbor. That's not very courageous, right? That's not really the way to handle it. But, you know, how often do people just close the door and not deal, right? I mean, whether it's climate, whether it's a rabbit dog, whether it's any of these things. And so this scene where Atticus takes a gun in his hand, floors his children because his children actually see him as old. He's 50, which is <laughs> how old I am, so he's not old. But they see him as, as an old man who's feeble, who can't play football, who abhors guns, abhors violence, always couches them and counsels them to turn the other cheek and not be in tussles at school. And he's always the, the he's never the macho guy. He's just the one who's always counseling them to be steady. And for them to see him pick up a gun, to be the one in town who the sheriff actually calls <laughs> to dispatch the dog because he's such a good shot and he will make it as humane as possible. And he will make sure the dog doesn't suffer unnecessarily. That was a huge turning point. And for Atticus to have that reservoir of potential violence within him <laughs> to his kids was a revelation. And it points to where does that reservoir come from? What experiences bring that? And it's, I think, mistakes being made along the way. It's um, uh, back to that uh, quote that I started out with, um, being, you know, human is having the confidence to keep trying and the humility to keep learning. And this is where I do think there's a crossroads with people in that at a certain age, people do give up and they sort of shut down and they've, they've had enough of the suffering side. And so they, they just don't evolve anymore. And at the same time, people feel like I, I know enough about the world. I, I don't need to learn anymore. Um, and so they close off and there's no point at which you can grow in that environment and so you know when you talk about courage I think it's the ability to flip those experiences of uh, death because he lost Atticus lost his wife um, his ability to flip uh, some horrors of war and some experiences with gun violence with regard to animals with regard to other things instead of just keeping that as informational it then it, it's taking it to that next step to make it transformational and so i think it's it's turning your reservoir of suffering into something beneficial for other people yeah i don't know if that answered every part of your question but thank you for that I, the scene with the dog was um very pivotal scene uh, in the book as well. But the idea that we shut ourselves off at a certain stage, but we have to confront violence sometimes instead of running from it. That's, that's very wonderful. I never thought, Robin, of Atticus as having a reservoir of violence within himself. And that is such an interesting use of a phrase that it was only because of his own personal experience, not only of watching violence happen, not only of probably having been subject to violence being inflicted upon himself, but of actually committing acts of violence himself, right? That he was able to be of service in this way. And yet the compassion with which he does it um, takes an act of physical violence and brings it into a moral realm of beneficence and wisdom, right? So there's that elevation 
of what on the physical plane might be considered violence, but on the spiritual plane is an act of transformation. It's kind of interesting too, you were talking about I, it, I, thou, and what lies in the middle? You know, if we take innocence and wisdom, what lies in the middle is violence. And it just struck me as, you, as everyone was talking that the violence is necessary to do. You've got to somehow kill your ego, you know, because, you know, when Atticus shoots the dog, it's not an I, it experience at all because he has no ego involved. Now, if he was the best shot and he wanted to kill for angry reasons, like most people with guns may want to do, you know, but he didn't. And so it was an I thou experience, even though it was outwardly violence, but it struck me that that middle step is the violence to kill your, your ego. You know, that sense of you that's so important that it pushes you to the I it. It won't allow the transformation. I've never seen heard those three terms, but it's kind of an interesting dynamic. It really is, and you, the way that you characterize it, I character, I had it as a different word, but I, I really like the way whether we're talking about violence or whether we're talking about suffering or uh, we're talking about conflict or of some kind that is tra traumatic to us is that that necessary catalyst in order to become better for the lack of a word in order to transcend our ego um i i think about it in terms of intention and that's exactly i think where you were going with it too renee like it, and you just said if someone's going out there like i'm the best shot and i'm gonna kill this dog and i'm gonna shoot him right through the eye because that what I can do that's a completely different intention than I'm going to help this dog pass peacefully with as in as humane a way possible with as little uh, trauma to other people and to the dog himself it's a completely different is it that the the act is the same but the the intention behind it is completely different and the sense of violence is completely different and it is an i thou relationship in that moment with that animal because it's a recognition of that dog's purpose energy essential being rather than being an object yeah and it's interesting that that i thou relationship is that humility we're talking about the humility tamps down the eye so that it almost disappears in the, the relational connective to, connectivity you were talking about. The eye isn't there to get in the way. The other part that I wanted to comment on, Renee, from what you were talking about is this bit of Atticus having a reservoir of violence. Um, and we may be talking about experience or we may just also be talking about an insight into human nature and the reason i say that is a different scene he anticipates that an angry mob is going to come and try to uh lynch tom robinson in the jail and so he comes and stations himself there and makes sure preemptively to you know put put uh measures in place so that that doesn't happen. Some other things ensue and, and Scout is there and, and reflects morality back onto the angry mob. But um, I just think that there's a recognition of the ugly side of human nature that Atticus is able to tap into as a lawyer, as a man, as uh, a father that gives him the ability to transcend and to act in a moral way. And I think other men and fathers in the book don't have that. They haven't evolved to that perspective. They have, they're still a little bit occupied in their own small world. 
haven't exactly figured out how I'm going to say all this, but something's going on in my head. And um, <laughs> so I don't know what's going to come out, but I'm, I'm thinking in the I thou, there's a place that there is no I and thou. There's a place that we just are one. And that um, what I see, uh, what the violence, I think Titnat Han was really good. And I don't remember exactly what he said, but he was the, the persecutor. He was, you know, we are all that. And that the violence we see in someone else is violence that we have inside of ourselves. And that uh, looking at the violence that I may or may not do to someone else may not be I don't kill them, but maybe it's a word, maybe it's a maybe it's a way that I respond or the way that I um, don't take care of Mother Earth or, you know, it's like looking at. Um, so that's part of that where there's no separation, but then. I just lost what I was thinking. Uh, there's some other part there that it's like we are separate and that it's our perception about what reality is. Um, someone can kill a dog and I perceive, oh, that's awful, but really it's an act of kindness or, you know, it's like, um, and I, I see that dimension going on in the world right now. Everyone has such different perceptions of what's needed and, and how it's being interpreted. And the way that we're interpreting is so far apart from each other that it's hard to come to a common that place that what you do to others you do to yourself, you know, and that there is no separation. So it's like, how do we treat, how do we live our life in this moment with kindness and with um, a sense of love and purpose to really not create that violence and to send out love and light instead of the anger and, and just to see it's our perception that says they're wrong. Although I really have some strong perceptions about some of those things, but it's like really saying that that that's part of who we are too. There's not a separation. So that's what I was thinking about. I think we've lost the, I don't, I don't have the, the exact quote in my mind, but it's, we've lost this sense of that there by the grace of God go I. We've lost that somehow along the way. And I wonder it as, as we're looking at heroism and as we're looking at courage uh, in, in our particular society and culture right now, where it, it, we're in turmoil about what which direction we need to go, different people believe wholeheartedly that they are doing the right thing. And the interpretation by another person is, is, is exactly what you said. It's, it's so uh, the perception it diminishes it uh, on on both sides. And so when we're in a state of flux like this and we're trying to find our way as a community and as a culture, how do we, what, how, how can we best be courageous? How can we best be heroic? And what is necessary in the moment? Is it to recognize our worst enemy's humanity? It really might be, you know, it really might be. Yeah, I was wondering, Robin, if you had any thoughts on why Harper Lee uh, has Bo, the neighbor, in the story. What what what's what's that relationship between um, Scout and Bo? And it's a relationship that evolves. And what 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 is Harper Lee trying to do there with that with that relationship? Yeah, there's uh, so in doing the research for this, I was interested in how autobiographical it really was because I wasn't familiar with how autobiographical some of the elements were. Um, Harper Lee's father was a lawyer. He did represent African-American. Uh, he did represent two um, African-American men accused of murder and they were convicted and they were killed and he never practiced criminal law after that. It was very tra traumatizing experience. Um, her experience of Lou Radley is based on a real event, a, a shut in neighbor of her childhood and the, the, a, a similar set of circumstances um, that led to that, but of course dramatized. And when you ask like what 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 purpose did that relationship serve? Um, a, a couple of things. I think it was a um, a way to let us observe Scout. Uh, she's the narrator. And so it was a, a way to allow us to observe Scout as as 
something other than the narrator, but as um, an outward person observing her development as as a child and, and an acknowledgement that she was in fact a child and she represents the innocence of this whole situation. And uh, I, I actually, I don't know, I mean, it's just like personally, I don't really, I wasn't too enamored with the whole end of, you know, where he came and saved her. I thought that was a little sensational. I thought it was a little like gratuitous and unnecessary because I thought that the relationship of that they had established of leaving small gifts and her you know, taking them and cherishing them and him having the the obvious joy from being able to influence that didn't think that that needed to be amplified to such a kind of a sensational way but um that's just me personally uh, but i think that it um it it was the part of the story that let us see scout's moral development with the most clarity the rest was a bit out of her own it was in her realm of of understanding and the things that were going on in the courtroom with Atticus and the things that were going on with Jem as he was getting older and doing guy things and her relationship with her friend Dill and her relationship with other neighbors, those were all informational. But I think that the way that we we see her understanding the world and starting to reflect back out is through her relationship and her changing opinion of Boo Radley and, and coming all the way around full circle. So also, uh, before I uh, hand it over to David, uh, could you talk a little bit about the phrase to kill a mockingbird in regard to Boo Radley? It's been, uh, it, it's been, there are a lot of different interpretations of what, where the, 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 title came from. Some people interpret it as um, a direct reference to Tom Robinson, and some people attribute it a bit more to um, Boo Radley. But the idea of the harmlessness and the essential beneficence of mockingbirds, as opposed to other birds that I guess in this, I'm not up on all of the the bird etymology, but um, as opposed to other birds that could do harm to crops that could be nuisances and invasive, mockingbirds were only there to provide um, joy. They were only bringers of joy. And to kill one was a just like a complete abandonment of your humanity. Like it was malicious, right? That maliciousness, like why would you ever kill a mockingbird that had never, you know, done anything to warrant it. And so it was like, like kind of, a, I guess I would just say abandonment of humanity. And in the case of Boo Radley, he had been stripped of his humanity by his in capture, by, by his, his, his uh, father basically shutting him into the house and never letting him out, a very abusive situation. And so, you know, in some senses, he was the mockingbird that was being stifled, that was being killed, and his relationship was with Scout was, and Jem to a certain degree, was um, a way to keep him alive, if that makes sense. But the 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 reasoning behind it and the the symbology of the mockingbird is that you know the innocence um, of of certain creatures is is I don't really know how I don't really know how else I want to say it yeah do you have something to add yeah I think you know when he actually saves the children and it is such a heroic act on his part because um he risks his own life to do so there would be a great temptation to create a lot of fanfare in the town about him having done that and um, someone, I believe it was Atticus, probably, who says, no, we can't do that. We, that, in a way, would be like killing a mockingbird. We have to pr protect Boo, because at this point in his time, he is so 
um, you know, he has so far retreated from the outside world that to make him a sensation uh, would would be in a, a sense a, an act of violence to him. Yeah. <sighs> Um, David, do you still have your question on your mind? <laughs> yeah, I was just going to uh, ask Robin if she could comment a little bit back to the scene of the advancing mob, because uh, you mentioned uh, innocence, violence, and wisdom. And it seems like in that scene, um, you've got wisdom acting in defense of innocence against the violence. And I just wondered if you could kind of tie that together for me. Yeah, with regard to this scene where uh, there's an angry mob uh, from like kind of the next town over, basically um, just people without a, a personal connection into this exact situation being um, just wanting the the visceral reaction of of, of coming to a lynching. Uh, and Atticus is stationed there to make sure that that doesn't happen. And he's been very uh, clear that his children are not to go anywhere near the situation at all. But of course they do because they're his children <laughs> and they're a bit reckless, but they're also curious and they're all the things that I'm sure he will um, be happy that they are when they're adults. Uh, so what ends up ensuing is that Scout, uh, there's a confrontation and in the confrontation, Atticus's um, way may or may not have prevailed. You know, he's the wisdom, right? But there's also a lot of anger and there's this violence coming in. And maybe the wisdom in this situation wasn't going to be enough to placate the mob. And Scout understood that on some level and came out and sort of threw herself into the mix to protect her dad. And her innocence uh, was enough to shake everybody into back to reality and for them to be able to uh, take a moment and take a pause to understand that there were depths that they wouldn't go to, that there were things that um, were too ugly about themselves in the light of her childhood um, to do. And so it ended up diffusing the situation. And I do think that there's something, as we're talking about it, something really interesting about how Atticus being a, a wise, measured, lawful individual may not have had the tools to stop that violence. It may not have been enough in that time to counteract that just visceral um, human reaction, but the combination of Scout coming in um, and reflecting it back on them. This is basically what she did. She just reflected their own ugliness right back to them was enough um, to make them pause and come to and come to their senses and leave. Thanks for bringing that up. It's also a really good scene. It's a, a great scene. And remember, she also talks to them and reminds them of their goodness. She might, reminds them of wonderful things that they've done. Um, and so that, I think, also her innocence um, reawakens their humanity when they kind of realize, oh, oh yeah, I, I, I'm better than this. You know, I do have this other side to myself and that uh, that side of conscience reawakened then uh prevented the the whole violence uh scene from happening i i wanted to ask about the role of heroism and and that in regard to um being truly human um i've read that atticus even though he's a fictional character, has for the legal profession held up a certain model of, of behavior, a certain code of ethics. I remember uh, a mentor uh, 
talking about the importance to children of always making sure to tell them plenty of stories of heroes. And so I just wondered if we could just talk for a little bit about how heroes, stories of heroes, um, somehow elevates or brings forth our humanity. And of course, Roger's here, who's uh, given us a talk on uh, Joseph Campbell and a hero of a thousand faces. So I imagine he has some thoughts too. Well, I, I certainly do. And also as a lawyer for 50 years, uh, I, I just saw this play on Broadway a couple of years ago. And it, and it focused a lot more, I think, than the book did on Atticus and his ability to uh, withstand uh, the pressures of, of defending uh, uh, Tom Robinson and, uh, and the horrors of uh, Robinson being convicted when there was, an, he'd, Atticus had demonstrated a, there was no possibility that he could have done it. So I just... Uh, for myself personally, it, it, it rings the bell of all the things I experienced uh, practicing law uh, with a, a large firm in a business setting, even though it's something different. I just, one example, the first time I, 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 came, I moved to Hawaii and I uh, was practicing law, I was 26 years old and one of the clients came in and I was tax lawyer and I said, look, if you had done this document six months ago, we'd be in a lot better shape. You'd, you'd owe less taxes. And he said, uh, well, let's just backdate the document. And so on a much, uh, a much different scale than Atticus Finch and all he went through, it was a mirror of, of uh, I think what we all experience in our in our careers, maybe lawyer is really something I, you come out of law school with a lot of idealism. And then when the reality hits, you find where your lines are drawn. Uh, fortunately, in that case, I came up with something I used for my whole career, which is I say, look, uh, we're only talking about money now. If we backdate those documents and we're caught, you and, and maybe I am gonna go to jail. And so with that kind of discussion, no one ever pushed me to do that. But I, I had partners who did, and, and some of them got in big trouble. So just in terms of the hero's journey, uh, the call came quickly to me in that instant. Did I want to accept the, 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 you know, the call to be honest and have integrity? Or was I going to go uh, and just do the... Uh, the easy thing or the thing that was pushing me by somebody who was paying my bill and uh, also, you know, impacting how I was going to be judged by the rest of the law firm uh, if he said what a lousy lawyer I was. So uh, that to me, this, this uh, well, the play really hit me hard and I, I thought powerfully about that. And today, uh, uh, as was just mentioned, how do we deal with the same kind of Southern mentality that we're seeing in a lot of people in our, uh, uh, you know, in our split society? And I think that's a terrific question too. Uh, how do we become, what do we do? Is it, do we, you know, it's, it's, it's a complex issue. So I, I think it's a great story and a lot of, as you've shown, tremendous meat in there for, for how we act today. Sure. I think um, it, as far as, as heroism, there's something much more, uh, much easier for us to internalize when the hero has a name and the hero has a face and the hero has ways than just these ideals and these virtues out in, you know, when you talk about integrity and you talk about honesty, of course, we want to embody integrity and honesty in our work. But those over time, especially as we grow up, we get a little bit jaded to things and those are just words 
where when you have a living, breathing hero like Atticus Finch or Gregory Peck, you know, I like you really can, um, it hits you in the heart. It hits you in a way that is much more visceral instead of academic and, or much more um, emotional instead of intellectual. And I, I would love to see that play. I think that play will be <laughs> something really to write home about. So um, yeah, but just those those two cents on, on can we find, you know, maybe make more of a point about naming and and describing our heroes and pointing them out because people make much more interesting meat than words in some respect. Yeah. So who's there ready to give a little vote of thanks to Robin for this excellent presentation? Cliff. Well, that was, I, I'm just so inspired. That's why I put my hand up. I, Robin, you, you gave us such a wonderful presentation on To Kill a Mockingbird and you took me to greater depths about the story and all the, the values of the story in our contemporary times. and as we enter a new year here with this new theme of being truly human, it just seems so, so appropriate, especially your emphasis on the idea of courage and how you brought out the, uh, that idea in the, in the novel as being so central. It, it seems that courage is in all the little things, you know, but the idea of not locking ourselves away, even though probably 2022 is gonna have a lot of rough bumps in it. Uh, and, we, and the temptation might be to close our doors and let those rabid dogs do their thing. We should be more like Atticus, I guess, you know, and, and be willing to, to get out there and stand up for things and, and be willing to say no as part of courage, as you said. So I, I just think it was just, the ability to take a story like that and use it as an illustration that we can reflect on in our own personal lives to uh, live a more ethical and moral life with all the challenges that we have to face going forward. I just think it was a wonderful presentation to start the new year and thank you so much. Uh, absolutely agreed. Thank you all so much for your attendance, all you true human beings <laughs> part of our lives. Oh, it means so much. Thank you for being here.